Hey Slashaholics, this is the Slasher Librarian, and I was going to let you all know that uh, one of my patrons, a longtime patron and friend of the channel, Liam Anderson, is going to be a guest narrator for the rest of this book. And if you're a patron, or want to become one, and you would like to guest narrate some chapters of a book in the future, just sign up on the Patreon page and let me know, and we'll get something worked out. Without further ado, here is Liam Anderson. Narrating chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Event Horizon, the novelization of the movie, written by Stephen E. MacDonald. Enjoy. I know I will. Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 6 There was a voice, somewhere calling him. The world was dark, formless, somehow. He knew this place. He was a blind man. A deaf man, his senses cut away, leaving him void. The voice came again, and now it deepened, thickened, became a swirling mass of noise, the mass choir of the damned pouring under and over, humanity tangled with inhumanity, in that terrible knotwork of sound, abrading him as it passed, leaving him bleeding at the edges of his soul. A tiny corner of his conscious mind informed him that he was enduring the effects of his time in the gravity couch. He was reawakening. Reassured by this thought, he somehow managed to open his eyes, to see. The other gravity couches came into sight, each of them filled with an inert figure suspended in dark fluid. Fair enough, that was how he must look then. With shocking abruptness, his viewpoint whirled about. Suddenly he was staring at his own tank, with its piece of yellowing masking tape stuck to the operations panel. His body was immobile, eyes closed. He could not tell whether he was looking upon a sleeping man or gazing at a corpse. For all he knew, they were all dead. Whispering again, someone whispering. The sound resolved slowly, a woman's voice in the distance. Voice hushed and bodiless, the sounds of a spectre. Forlorn, that voice and now it was becoming clearer. Billy. He felt ice creep from his crotch to his heart, and found himself wondering how a ghost could experience sensation. He wanted to explore now, to find the voice, answer its siren call. Before him, his body, formerly dead, if only in hypersleep, came to life. Eyes opening. In a flash, his vision shading to green for a moment. Weir found himself back inside his own flesh. Firmly anchored, his world was liquid, warm, filled with tinted blurs. He had no sense of breathing. He had no sense of panic. I'm so cold. His gravity couch drained, the gel sl sluicing away with a remarkable speed. He could move now, if only in slow motion. Lifting a hand, he, pre he pressed his palm against the cold door, pushing the door opened easily. Another sound in the distance, rever reverberant, drip, 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 the sound of water dripping where it was not supposed to drip. He looked around, found the crew members still suspended in their tanks. Only had, only he had been awakened and, and had emerged. Why is that? He wondered. No answer was forthcoming. <laughs> He discovered that this did not concern him at the moment. The dripping continued, filling his world. The voice came again, whispering through the ship. I'm so cold. Drawn, he walked slow motion to the hatchway and found that his tentative steps were being made in 20 league boots, covering great distances through the ship. Within several steps, he was at the bridge of the Lewis and Clark, standing in the second level behind the pilot's chair, dripping. Water dripped to the floor of the bridge, making pools, running in rivulets along the plating. The pilot's chair was soaked, streaming. A woman sat in the chair, her two pale skin drenched, glittering, her sodden hair plastered to her naked back. As thought rooted to the deck, Weir stood and stared. Uncertainly, he whispered, Claire, there was no answer from the woman in the pilot's chair, nor did she move. 
she gave no indication that she knew anyone was there. No indication that she was even alive. There was only the sound of the water dripping. He could not hear the sound of breathing, not even his. Slowly, he reached out to touch her shoulder, hesitated, feeling cold stealing over his fingertips. Fear bubbled darkly within him, rose. He pulled his hand back, clenching it into a fist. Whispering, he said her name again. Claire. No movement, no sound, only water. I'm sorry, he said, but even this had no effect on the woman sitting before him. Claire? He forced his hand to unclench, straightening the fingers. He reached out slowly, ignoring the cold, touching her hair, feeling the cold wetness. No reaction. He might as well have been touching a statue. He looked down, hoping for a glimpse of her face, a reflection, finding it in the moribund computer displays. There was something wrong with the reflection, though. Something distorted. The planes and contours of her face were shifting, as though something lived under the skin, in the bone, and was pushing angrily to be free. The fear welled up in a dark torrent now, soul poisonous and choking. Panicking, he spun her shit. Panicking, he spun her chair, making it rock on its gimbals. Claire stared up at him. I'm waiting, she said. The sound filling this reality with undertones of screaming, hissing, crawling voices. His soul splintered. The darkness swept through him. Silence. Chapter 7 He fell through the silence, through the darkness all sensation absent. His eyes opened and he was flooded with light. There was a sucking sound too close to his head, then a humming that made him wince. His mind and body too sensitive, too raw to withstand it for very long. There was something in his mouth, coating his tongue, making him salivate uncontrollably. Surging from the darkness and silence, falling back into the world, he found himself surrounded by metal and plastic. A coffin too tight around him, crushing in, threatening him with suffocation and darkness. There was light in front of him, but he found he could not reach it through the wall around his body. Something moved towards him through the bright blur. His heart pounded frantically, making the veins in his neck and wrist pulse. Blood seemed replaced with fire, yet he felt cold all over, layered with ice. Unable to think, to reason out a proper course of action, he lifted his hands and pushed at the door of his gravity couch. The inner surface was slick with the remnants of gel. Smearing as his hand slipped, furiously he pounded the heel of his right hand against the unyielding door, trying to make it give way. This effort availed him nothing. He lurched backwards as far as he could go, intending to kick at the door, to pummel it with his heels to make it give, to allow him freedom to breathe. Before he could strike the first blow, there was a loud hydraulic hiss, deafening in the confined space. His tomb opened to, to decant him. Off balanced, Weir fell forward, his feet sliding in gel on the floor of the tank. With no one to catch him and nothing to grab to stop his fall, he crashed to the deck. His right shoulder, hip, and knee flaring with pain. Gel and saliva poured from his mouth, pulled by his face as he gasped for breath. A human fish drowning in oxygen. His lungs and bronchia flamed, tried to close up, leaving him wheezing and moving weakly as the claustrophobia continued to shake him, closing his mind down in a paroxysm of terror. The medical bay was a vague place to him, perceived through a veil, he fought for focus, but it would not come. Peters was quick at his side, one hand on his shoulder, another on his wrist. So familiar, so warm, adjusting so that she could take an ad hoc reading of his pulse. Claire, he said, his voice little more than a gasp. The last thing he remembers would The last thing he remembered was Claire. Something wrong with Claire. He felt Peters' hand tighten on him trying to soothe, trying to calm him back to this reality he had fallen into. He knew that she wanted to get inside his head, 
to deal with this latest crisis of his. But he refused that help. Had always refused that kind of help. He railed against her contact, not wanting to release either the past or the nightmare until he understood it. Had mapped the geography of life gone awry. He gasped in another breath, and the fire shot into his head, into his belly. DJ! Peters called, her voice urgent. Her hands tightened again and then relaxed as she said, It's okay, you're okay, just breathe. Her face came into view, a curious mixture of mother and professional medic, concerned and observant. We wanted to fight her, to keep struggling for his anguish. But the edges of the nightmare were fading now, and the claustrophobia was easing. Here in the open medical bay, there was a sense of relaxation in his chest, and he found that it had become easier to breathe. The graying at the edges of his vision began to recede, leaving a scattering of little stars flashing in his vision. We looked up. All of the crew stood in a circle around him, looking down. DJ, emergency pack in hand, was kneeling by was kneeling beside him, checking him over for serious damage. Weir had no doubt that DJ could, if necessary, have him sedated in a matter of moments. He pawed at the air, trying to push Peters away. She, however, was too practiced, too far ahead of him, and she evaded his telegraphed efforts. Maintaining her calming contact, Weir closed his eyes for a moment as his body began to relax. He looked up at DJ, tried to push himself into at least a sitting position. I'm all right now, he said, knowing it to be a magnificent lie. Stubbornly, not willing to admit that the truth fell far short of the statement, he repeated his assertion. I'm all right. To prove the point to those of the crew who doubted this assertion, everyone, as far as he could tell, he tried to push himself to his feet. His legs shook violently as he tried to stand and his knees buckled, the muscles refusing to have anything to do with his intended course of action. DJ caught him before he could tumble back to the deck, helping him stay up, helping him to stay upright. Peters stepped away now, and he found that he missed the contact, the support. DJ was a cold monolith. Move slowly, DJ said, staring at him without flinching. You've been in stasis for 56 days. You're going to you're going to experience a little disorientation. A little. Something dark had crawled into his dreams in the tank, and he was not quite back in the real world now. Reality had not spun around him as confusedly as this since the first time he had ridden to orbit, taking an ill-advised window seat in the big elevator car on Skyhawk 1. In his experience, perspectives changed enormously and abruptly following long periods of ennui. During that journey along the length of the Skyhawk 1, he had seen this world unfold and refold beneath him, a great blue and white flower afloat in a bottomless sea. By the end of the journey, he had come to an intuitive understanding of the geometry of space-time that had complemented his technical knowledge. He wondered what insights and visions awaited him now, DJ quickly looked Weir over before letting him go. Weir wobbled for a moment, unsteady and queasy, but finally managed to keep his balance. There was a faint sense of embarrassment at standing there in nothing more than a bikini briefs, the centre of attention for the entire crew, but there was nothing to be done about that. At least there was Cooper, still bare-ass naked and utterly free of all concern, leaning into Weir and saying, Damn, Dr. Weir, don't scare us like that. Weir gave him a sickly smile. Cooper seemed, on their short acquaintance, to be Peters' counterpart, a humorous male spirit, a dark pan. Coffee? What? Weir said. Cooper trotted over to the wall, pulling out a large metal cylinder. He held this up for Weir to see. Coffee. Weir frowned in understanding. An expression that made his face hurt. No, thank you. Cooper shrugged and turned away. The crew had returned to pers purposeful movement, leaving Weir standing, confused and disconsolate. In the middle of the room, 
Miller was already into his flight suit, while Smith, in a corner, did stretching exercises, limbering himself up. Cooper, still showing no concern about dressing, had opened the metal cylinder and was pouring coffee into a mug he had retrieved from one cubbyhole or another. DJ had sewed his emergency kit and quickly pulled on a flight suit. Stark was climbing into her flight suit, drawing an admiring glance from Cooper, who, we noted, was mainly admiring Stark's backside. Without looking around, Stark flipped Cooper the bird. Cooper's eyes lit up as he smiled. Is that an offer? It is not, was Stark's growl reply. We went in search of his own clothes, trying to understand how anyone could get used to the effects of long-term gravity cap suspension. His entire body felt toxic, and his mind was sluggish, drained of energy and knowledge. He felt unwilling and unable to accommodate anyone's needs right now. He was not sure he could even manage to dress. At least they were close to their, his, goal. The event horizon was waiting, full of truths that were rightfully his. He had sent the event horizon and her crew down the rabbit hole. Whatever knowledge she had gleaned about Wonderland was his to hold first. Miller pulled on his boots, quickly lacing them up, and then zipped on his flight suit. There was no sign of playfulness about him, only an economy of movement that we envied, and a fierce energy that left him apprehensive. Miller turned towards Stark, who was pulling on her boots. Stark, he barked. Why aren't you on the bridge? Stark gave him an acidic look, but it was not enough to make Miller relent. Still, she was not about to be bullied. Lacing up her boot, and gr- she growled back. Do you mind if I get dressed first? Yes, I do, Miller said. He bunched his hands into fists, put those on his hips, planned his feet apart, turning his head, surveying his crew, his domain. We honestly did not want to cross this man. Come on, people, let's go. Smith was the first one through the exit, followed closely by Stark, Justin and DJ. Miller turned to follow and then swung back, his face a study in thunder. And Coop? The captain added, giving Cooper's crotch a withering glance. Put some pants on. Chapter 8 It seemed to Weir, as though activity aboard the Lewis and Clark, once begun, never paused for a moment. Miller, Stark and Smith went forward into the bridge to do whatever it was that spaceship bridge crews did at times like these. Somewhere along the way, Peters had handed him a big warm blanket and he had wrapped himself in this hoping to combat the shivering. He knew he was suffering from some kind of shock related to the time he had spent suspended in the gravity couch. But at the moment, he would have preferred not to have any kind of ability to think. Either sleep or a nice warm corner would have done just as well. Neither Peters nor Cooper had been able to convince him that the ship's interior temperature was reasonable. He felt cold. Justin, Cooper and Peters had set to the crew's quarters, turning them into a place to spend time, opening bunks, unfolding tables, taking out chairs. The Lewis and Clark was a fine example of environmental engineering, we thought, with just about everything aboard designed to fit into a niche or fold away. It was easy for the crew to make room or ready the ship for the powerful thrust from the ion drive. At the moment, DJ was moving around in the cabin, checking radiation badges, apparently for something to do while he avoided talking to Weir. For the moment, Weir found it hard to care. If anything, he would rather be left alone, huddled on a chair at the side of the cabin. This particular misery was not something he had anticipated. Scribbling equations all over the reams of paper did not prepare a man for the realities of deep space travel. Cooper, Justin and Peters had finished setting up the crew's quarters and were now comfortable on bunks. Peters watching a video unit. The two men were engaging in pitching a small ball back and forth across the cabin, their expressions gradually easing into a mock display of contempt for each other. Cooper once again snatched the ball out of the air, sneering at Justin. When are you going to put some heat on that? He snapped the ball back at Justin. Justin caught it staring into Cooper's eyes, challenging. You can't handle my junk, Papa Bear. Don't ask for the heat. The ball sailed back again, straight for Cooper's head. Don't play ball in the house, P. 
Peter said, not looking up from the video unit she was watching. Both Cooper and Justin ignored this automatic response from her, continuing to toss the ball between them, somehow managing to avoid DJ. Weir leaned forward, tilting his head, curious about the video she was watching. She had taken out a handheld unit, rather than using the Lewis and Clark's main vid system, and the sounds he had been hearing confirmed his suspicion. This was something of a more private nature, rather than a professional production of some kind. Peter saw Weir looking over at her at the vid unit, and he had a momentary flash of embarrassment at being caught in his peeping game. Rather than the negative reaction he inspected, however, she turned slightly, tilting the unit so that he could see the screen. She turned her attention back to what she was watching. Weir focused on the screen, blinking as the image changed rapidly, blurring first with a panning movement and then then with a too fast zoom. He saw the makings of a party. Ribbons, balloons, heard the sounds of children and a thin background of music. The image blurred again, then blanked. The screen cleared to show a child in a wheelchair. Weir estimated the boy's age at four or five. Wondering how far off he was, he could only make a bare guess at the nature of the child's handicap, or how long he had been in the wheelchair, though the chair itself did not appear to have been heavily used. The boy was grinning happily, waving his arms. Not quadriplegic then, he thought, a simple paraplegia of some kind, leaving the mind intact and the body more or less functional. Some of these physical dysfunctions could be corrected now, with the help of nanosurgery, but not all. The boy held up his arms, laughing. Play horsey, mummy, play horsey, he called. The image shook and shifted and abruptly zoomed back. Peters came into view on the bid screen, looking sunny and relaxed, her clothes bright and loose on her slender frame. To Weir, she did not look the slightest bit like someone who spent a great deal of time in space. Peters watching, smiled. Peters on the screen, laughing, cried. Want to play horsey, do you? In a voice that bespoke motherhood and joy. She bent and grasped the child in one long swooping motion, that made the boy howl with delight, lifting him out of the wheelchair, flying him through the air, somehow ending up with him on her back. Somewhere deep inside Weir there was an ache. He chose not to address it, choosing instead to accept the diversion of Miller striding across the hatchway, coming back to the crew quarters from the bridge. He kept his silence as Miller sat down next to Peters, giving her a sympathetic glance. I put in a replacement for you. Miller said without even glancing at Weir. But on short notice like this... He might as well point it directly at Weir. Shame burned in Weir's chest, mixed with an uncomfortable rage. It isn't my fault, he thought angrily. He had not planned this, and he had not singled out Miller's ship and crew. Miller did not seem to want to approach this rationally. Peter shrugged and shoved the vid unit, putting it aside. No, no, it's all right, she said and gave Weir a friendly, understanding glance, almost speaking to him. I talked to my ex. He'll keep Denny over Christmas, and I'll get him in the summer. She gave Miller a brittle smile and told the truth about her dilemma and her feelings. So everything's all right? Miller continued to look at her for a few moments, his dark face unreadable. He wanted his scapegoat, Weir thought, his reason for being furious with the world. USAC High Command was too far away, too impersonal for that purpose. Right or wrong, he had a passenger he could focus on. Now Peters was trying to take that away from him by not letting Miller use her as a reason to pull the screws on his enigmatic guest. Miller softened momentarily, a flash that was gone as quickly as it came. He glanced quickly at Weir, but there was no challenge there now. He did not expect this ad hoc truce to last. Stark and Smith arrived, also coming back from the bridge. Both of them looking tense, neither of them paying Weir much attention. Stark sat down next to Miller, leaning forward, while Smith took up a position behind the chair. Weir was huddling on. Weir looked around, up for a moment, risking a crick in his neck. Smith looked down at him like the wrath of God, 
his dark eyes unwavering. It figured, Weir thought, he had managed to usurp the pilot's regular crew quarters chair. Cooper and Justin paid the psychodrama no attention whatsoever, tossing the ball back and forth. Behind Weir, Smith intoned, Two hours to Neptune orbit. The words had all the sound and authority of the last trump, meant to make Weir quake. Smith's pronouncement out of the way, Stark looked at Miller and said, All boards are green. Everything's five by five. That's good to know, Miller rumbled. The ball whizzed by him on its way from Cooper to Justin. Miller gave the younger man an impatient look that was tinged with suggestion of violence. Justin, you want to stow that? Justin clutched the ball to his chest, looking abashed. Cooper grinned at him while Peters offered a I told you so, look. Mum might let the boys get away with it, but Dad was home now. Miller leaned forward, clasping his hands together, his expression deadly serious. Okay, listen up, he said, looking around at his crew. As you all know, we have an addition to our crew. Dr. Weir, this is Stark, my exo. Smith, pilot. Justin, ship's engineer. You can call him Baby Bear. Cooper interrupted, sliding smooth into the gap that Miller granted him. Justin grinned and Stark snorted, amused. Miller looked around at Cooper. This is Cooper. What the hell do you do on this ship anyway? Cooper gave a show of thinking, his eyebrows working. Taking his cue, Justin said, Bolast. Cooper leaned down over the side of his bunk, threatening to slide off onto the deck. He gave Weir a kissy-faced stare that made the scientist flinch back. I'm your best friend, Cooper said, his voice sing-song. I am a lifesaver and a heartbreaker. Weir was not sure how he could react to this particular display. So he chose to avoid a response altogether. Helplessly, he looked at Miller, who looked impatiently back. He's a rescue technician. Peters, medical technician. DJ? Trauma, DJ said softly. So DJ and Peters were the medical tag team. One dealing with the broken ones Peters could not easily fix. Cooper hauled himself back onto his bunk, his expression serious for once. All right, everyone knows each other. So what are we going... So what are we doing all the way out here, Skipper? Dr. Weir, Miller said, turning to look at the bedraggled scientist. Weir cleared his throat, hesitating. At the beginning, he had imagined dramatic pronouncements and grand moments. Instead, he was wrapped in a blanket, stuffed into a spacecraft that had very little to do with human comfort, and presented with a small crew that was almost openly hostile. Had he known how things were to have worked out, he would still have demanded to go with the salvage crew. It was time he tried to smooth things over. In his mind, he said, First of all, I'd like to say how much I appreciate this opportunity. Miller rolled his eyes, shook his head, anger radiating off him in waves. Dr. Weir, he growled slowly, we did not volunteer for this mission. We were pulled off leave to be sent to Neptune. It is three million clicks past even the remote, remotest outpost. Miller took a deep breath. And the last time the USAC attempted to rescue this far out, we lost both ships, so please, cut to it. So there was another root cause of Miller's attitude. Rescue and salvage was Miller's life, and he knew the odds for success in most situations. What we knew, and, and he believed Miller would eventually learn, was that the event horizon was extraordinary, that the mission they were on was without precedent. We took a deep breath. Everything I am about to tell you is considered code black by the NSA. Weir paused, letting the crew have time to look at each other. A code black classification was not something a crew like this would hear on a regular basis. Inter-service rivalries had not waned since the paranoia of the 1950s, with bureaucratic interchanges turning into nightmares of documents, codes, classifications, protocols and formats. For the USAC to accept a National Security Agency code black without apparent comment 
indicated something very serious, very unpleasant. Whatever was going on here, it was bigger than USAC. The crew had not known that beforehand. Weir wondered if they would develop an increased respect for him. He doubted it. Cooper looked back at Weir, then at Miller, from his bunk, just and said, That means top secret, Coop. Cooper looked around at Justin. You don't need to tell me about cold black, baby bear. Weir heard the attempt at jovality in Cooper's voice. The rescue tech simply could not sustain it. Weir took a deep breath. The crew was finding its own level for this, giving him a chance to go on. He tugged the blanket more tightly around his body, resisting the urge to shiver. The USAC intercepted a radio transmission from the decaying orbit around Neptune. The source has been identified as the Event Horizon. There was dead silence. We waited. He wished he could hide. This was not his job. Her eyes flashing as she turned to glare at him, Stark snapped. That's impossible! She looked around the cabin, almost surged forward. She was lost with all hands, what, seven years ago? Justin winced, all playfulness lost. Yeah, the reactor blew. How can we salvage? Peter started, turning to Weir, a confused expression on her face. She knew what she had to be thinking. There could be nothing to salvage, aside from a few bits of radioactive debris. Standing behind Weir, now leaning closer to him, an angry, threatening presence. Smith growled. Let the dead rest, man. Weir turned to look at Smith, chills rising up his spine. Cooper was getting wound up now. Weir turned his attention back to him, hearing him yelling angrily. Cancel our leave and send us out on some bullshit mission? As he waved his fist in the air, he looked as though he was about to slide down from his bunk to stalk furiously around the crew quarters. Weir did not think that Cooper was about to turn violent, but he was no psychologist. He figured that there was no good reason to put theory to test in this case. Miller let the racket go on for a few more moments, then stood up, holding his hands in the air as he bellowed. Everybody shut up! Silence fell again. Weir's ears were ringing. Let the man speak! Miller sat down again. Weir took another deep breath. He hoped that what he was about to say would change the perspective of this crew. Enough for them to be of use to him in retrieving his ship. What was made public about the event horizon, Weir went on, that she was a deep space research vessel, that its reactor went critical, that the ship blew up. There was silence now, and he had their undivided attention. Having introduced them to the idea of cover-up and conspiracy, that was juicy, something for them to fasten on to. The event horizon was the culmination of a secret government project to create a spacecraft capable of faster-than-flight flight. They're all staring at him again, their expressions shocked. This was not something they had heard about, had not even suspected. It had not been possible to keep the event horizon completely secret, once the pure development process was over and the construction process began. But it had been possible to keep a lid on the true nature and purpose of the project. There had been a desire for a deep space research platform after the successes in exploiting this asteroid belt, and the Event Horizon project had played into that, hiding the truth in plain sight. In the end, no one had known what had happened, out here at Neptune. Smith, the ominous edge gone from his voice, said, You can't do that. The law of relativity prohibits faster than light travel, Stark said, before we could answer Smith. These people were still trying to deal with the concepts and ideas illuminated by Einstein. They were unlikely to reach as high as the work of Hawking or even Gribben, probably considering quarks to be the noises made by ducks and tachyons as something you used to hang a picture. Patiently, Weir said, Relativity, yes. He paused for a moment, trying to bring things a bit closer to the level of those he had to deal with. We can't break the law of relativity. We can... But we can go around it. The ship doesn't really move faster than light. 
He gestured with his hands, his blanket becoming more precarious with his motion. It creates a dimensional gateway that allows the ship to instantaneously jump from one point in the universe to another, light years away. They're all watching intently now, trying to understand him. No matter what, he still felt like an advanced Jungian in a room filled with Freudian novices. How? Stark asked. Her voice had a glassy edge. We shrugged. Well, it's difficult to... He stopped, feeling helpless as the equations glowed across his mind. A pure blend of mathematics and practical physics. One day he had known how to bend space and had sent, set out to prove it. It's all math, you see, but... He trailed off again, still trying to reduce the concepts. He had cracked the sky. Now he had to explain it to these people. In layman's terms... You, you use a rotating magnetic field to focus a narrow beam of gravitons. These in turn fold space-time consistent with whale tensor dynamics until the space-time curvature becomes infinitely large and you have a singularity. Miller was staring at him, shaking his head. Layman's terms? We closed his eyes momentarily, trying to compose himself. Cooper was lunging over the side of his bunk again. Fuck Lehman's terms. What about English? We opened his eyes, sighing. How in the name of hell was he supposed to get these concepts across to people who could barely function without an easy guide and good fortune? He looked around the cramped crew's quarters, spotting the edge of something, a poster on the inside of an open locked door. Let's try this, he said, reaching out without thinking and tearing the poster down. The name on the locker door as it bounced shut, was Smith. That did not matter now. Excuse me, Smith start, started, more shocked at Weir's abrupt action than outraged at his audacity. Weir shot him a look, and the pilot took a step backwards, not saying anything else. Weir turned back to the other crew members, holding up the poster, making the paper snap in his hands. Doggedly, he said, say this paper represents space-time. He slapped the pin up, onto the nearest flat surface and then made a half turn, picking up a pen as he did so. He quickly marked an X on the pinup, putting a letter A at one side. And you want to get from point A here to point B here. He scribbled another X, this time marked with a B. Now, what's the shortest distance between the two points? The crew member stared at him as though he had turned into a raving idiot. What did they expect? There were non usolated geometries involved here, and many human minds could not go around the requisite corners. He knew that his audience resented being thrown back into grade school, but it was the only way he knew how to get even a fraction of the concepts across. Finally, Justin said, A straight line. He had a confused look, as though he was certain something was missing from the answer. The other crew members turned to stare at the engineer, who proceeded to glare back at them, annoyed and embarrassed. What? Wrong, Weir said, trying for a sympathetic smile that he knew was forced and looked uncomfortable. Everyone turned to stare at the scientist again. The shortest distance between two points is zero. He held the poster up, folding it so that the first X was over the second. With a fast, vicious movement, he drove the pen through the layers of paper. Melodramatic, but functional. Smith hadn't even complained about the wanton destruction of his pinup. He lowered the poster, looking at them intently. That's what the singularity does. It folds space so that point A and point B coexist in the same space and time. After the ship passes through this gateway, space returns to normal. He handed the punctured poster back to Smith, who took it gingerly, looking at Weir as though the scientist might turn rabid at any moment. It's called a gravity drive. Justin was watching Weir intently, genuinely curious. How do you know all this? There was a $64,000 question. Weir squared his shoulders and said, I built it. Cooper made a noise that indicated that he was either impressed or coming to a boil. For good measure, he added, I can see why they sent you along. Justin was frowning now, 
They're obviously putting the bits and pieces of information together and coming up with a result he liked less and less with each passing moment. So if the ship didn't blow up, what happened? The mission was going perfectly, we said frowning, remembering. Like a textbook, the ship reached safe distance using conventional thrusters. All the systems looked good. He set back, his enthusiasm and drive draining as the memories flooded back in. The event horizon had torn a hole in the heavens and his life had been sucked into it. All the systems looked good. They received the go-ahead to activate the gravity drive and open the gateway to Proxima, Centauri, the sun's closest star. We paused for a few moments, lost in the past, replaying those hours, those days in central operations. Everything came crashing down in such a short span of time, taking the foundations of his entire life. She vanished from all our scopes, disappeared without a trace. He paused, looking at Miller. The captain was watching him intently. Until now. Miller grimaced, but his eyes were full of curiosity. He needed the know. Where has it been the past seven years? We are set back, his blanket forgotten. That's what we're here to find out. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters six, seven, and eight of Event Horizon. Great job, Liam. Uh, you did a great job with your first narration. I was enthralled editing it. I really enjoyed it. Um, looking forward to what you do with the rest of the book, honestly. And I'm really enjoying the writing by Mr. McDonald. This is one of my favorite horror movies of all time, so I'm really, really interested to see how the novelization plays out. I thought it ended at a good place right there. Uh, we'll be back very soon with more chapters from uh, Liam. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.